All right, welcome to Serial Bookworms, where we read through web serials, chapter through chapter. Well, not chapter by chapter, groups of chapters. We are reading through Mother of Learning. We are on chapters 10 through 12. So once again, we come to our character Zorian being woken up by his sister. But this time he baffles her and manages to slip into the bathroom before she locks it up. Finally, finally, Zorian gets a W in this time loop. I mean, even if it's just getting to piss without having to wait on his conniving sister. It's kind of weird how she keeps suddenly waking up, him up and then dashing straight to the bathroom. Hmm. Our next scene is a familiar train ride, now quite similar to a loading screen where the mission objectives are laid out. Zorian is thinking of changing gears this loop and doesn't plan on continuing the library route now that he has uh, shaping exercises from Ilsa. He also resolves not to brave the invasion anymore. The aversion he feels is so strong he's willing to throw out his plans of lying low and confessing that he's in the loop to Zack if he must. Uh, we, we're starting to see, like, even though he is looping through this month, uh, mental effects, trauma, and things like that are very real uh, effects that carry on with him loop to loop. And uh, mental health is probably going to be kind of important uh, to manage in this circumstance, uh, more so than one might think. We see Zorian engaging in a very interesting bit of introspection, examining his thoughts and feelings and following them down to the core reason they flow from. And at the root of this impulse is helplessness. He doesn't have the, the skills. He's seeing people he knows die and nothing he's done really changes the outcome. Stop the wolves, now it's a worm. Maybe he stops the worm and a troll will show up. There seems to be improbable things occurring during the invasion. Zorian again muses on the third time trial of her theory, wondering if they're helping the opponents. But if so, why haven't they shown up and dealt with Zack? We also get a call back to Zorian's rain musings from the first chapter. Zorian wished he had some kind of rain protection spell. The first drops of rain were already starting to fall. That, or an umbrella. Either would work just fine, except an umbrella didn't require several years of training to use. And look at Zorian now. It's only been about nine months, and he is already able to cast a spell well enough for a couple hours of drizzle to be fended off. Though, it is interesting how the spell specifically pushes away all the water, even if it's on the ground. Being able to arbitrarily separate water seems kind of useful in chemistry, especially if that spell could be tuned to other substances or as an offensive weapon. You know, if you desiccate a person, they tend to have an unpleasant time. I don't know if you've ever had dry eyes before, but it is not fun. It could be a weak effect, as we learned previously, people have an innate magic resistance that needs to be overcome for spells to affect persons internally. That's probably why generally people can learn this spell and it's not an issue to be casting it. Uh, you probably would have to structure it in a specific way to be overpowering people's magic resistance to make it harmful to them. Or perhaps the spell, just the way it's constructed, would not be capable of channeling that amount of power and just kind of fall apart. I don't know. One of those little details. We don't know kind of the specifics, but it's one of the fun things about this magic system, how it seems to have rules, but is a little flexible. We get an early divergence in this time loop, and Zorian didn't even cause it this time. Apparently, Zack has a rocky relationship with the Guardian appointed to manage the Nevada Estates. And by rocky, I mean he dueled and defeated Tessin Zveri. We do learn about some kind of noble or action from this. Uh, Tessin is part of the Elders of Eldamar. Uh, likely it's some group of nobility, as it's specifically a crime to attack them. 
We'll need to see if we learn more about peoples in this group or details about them. They may be related to the government in some major way, considering, you know, the country is Eldamar. Could be sort of descendants of major persons who founded the country, mayhaps? Hmm. We get an idea of what Zorian focusing single-mindedly on a project looks like. He's skipping classes, blowing off homework, to the extent that even the class leader Akosia gets the teacher to intervene. Of course, a simple excuse of, he's working on a project, it'll be done at the end of the month. <laughs> Don't worry. And that's enough to assuage Ilsa's concerns. There is still a one-liner once again being thrown away about Zim still having him on basic three practice. And it's kind of interesting. We haven't had a scene with Zim, Zim in a while. And anytime they're brought up, it's still just usually a one-liner about working on the basic three. Come the invasion, Zorian opts to simply get on a hill with a view of the city rather than taking the train out like he has been a few times takes note of some of the broad stages of the evasion, and we kind of get things roughly laid out for us. There's the artillery barrage hidden amidst the fireworks. Fire elementals spawn from those uh, attacks, and they sort of cause some mayhem. Monsters spew out from the sewers, and then finally the mages from the enemy make an appearance. Uh, of them, it seems the artillery crippling the city defenses is what Zorian thinks is the most devastating because you know, it, it seems to be very accurate in slowing down the response and making things much more chaotic and easier for the invasion forces to do more damage and be more effective. Zorian repeats this cycle in broad strokes a few times. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a, a typical Time loop, yeah, yeah, we're kind of skipping through a bit of time. And uh, it seems like Zack is doing very similar things as well. You know, he's dueling and beating up Tenson and then gallivanting off to wherever. Unfortunately, even the single-minded focus of Zorian has limits, and he's at his wit's end. In mastering those 15 shaping exercises Ilsa of Teacher's Past gave to him. Zorian tries to ply his utter mastery of the Mott's coursework by this time for concessions from Ilsa. He's rewarded with a pile of books to round out the gaps in his impromptu test show. Zorian rallies as if he can survive Zim's mentoring methods for a year, subjectively. He could read a few manuals. Zorian will return and Ilsa will rule the day she underestimated a Kazinski. We smash cut to Zorian waking up and for once he is Calm. Nice, even, to Creel, thanking her for waking him up. Ironically, this lack of dramatic response actually gets her to climb off him for once. She begs for him to use some magic, and he humors her request by conjuring a few orbs of light to fly around. This is an interesting way to show Zorin's growth and mastery of the shaping exercises we've had mentioned. Uh, he used to struggle with multitasking, you know, uh, hovering a pen and then above his hand and then spinning it. Now he's created multiple differently colored orbs separate from his palm and he has them flying around. We also learn an interesting tidbit. Mastering certain groups of shaping exercises can make invocations relating to them more powerful and efficient. Learning that tidbit has mollified Zorian of much of his grumbling about always being given all these shaping exercises to work on. And I think that's kind of interesting in the greater context. If we reference back to Zim and his insistence on mastering the fundamentals, the basic three. Is Zim being a hard ass because he's a grouchy, difficult person who doesn't want to mentor young mages or... Does he actually have a specific purpose he's reinforcing by ensuring Zorian is absolutely perfect in the basic three? We have to probably keep this in mind as we learn more about shaping and perhaps when Zorian can finally advance in his mentorship under Zvim. Unfortunately, Zorian forgets he had his room filled with an amateur planetarium and he brought Ilsa there to discuss his upcoming semester choices. 
Turns out the flooding lights are not exactly a spell he should have access to right at the moment. Zorian name drops his older brother to deflect suspicion, grousing internally that Damien can get away with anything. Ilsa hands him the admittance scroll as usual, but has a bit of a comment this time. And you know how to produce something other than white light, Ilsa knows it. Impressive. I guess this should be easy for you, then. Zorian almost does what he's done every time in the past, shove mana into the seal holding the letter closed and break it open. But with Ilsa focusing on him and her comments, it causes him to reevaluate the scroll, and with close examination, he realizes he's been doing it wrong for the whole past subjective year. In fact, the seal literally says right on it what he needed to do leverage his mana control and just channel into certain areas around the edges to pop it off cleanly. Ilsa asks that he visit her office when he gets to Sayoria so they can continue their discussion. Back over in Ilsa's office after a quick smash cut, uh, we see Zorian uh, acing all of her surprise tests and Ilsa is baffled. We get a bit of a benchmark for where Zorian is passing the end of third year exams, which makes sense as Zorian's subjective time puts him at the end of the third year, though his shaping skills put him ahead of the curve compared to his typical peers in the area. You know, he's up to about eight to 10 mastered shaping skills where most of his peers probably would be at two or three. Despite all of this, however, it is still not impressive enough for Zorian to be free from Zim's clutches. Ilsa does agree to arrange uh, private instruction in a field of his choice. He immediately picks spell formulas. We've had a lot of shaping exercises, uh, talks of unstructured magic versus structured invocations, but it looks like we're finally going to be learning about the third kind of magic usage mentioned way at the start of the book. Zorian is referred to a very sedate and kind of a mouse. <laughs> oh, what story do you think we're reading here? Now, Zorian will be studying under Nora Bull, the teacher that gave them 12 books in the first week and 60 question tests every other class. <laughs> Moving into the next chapter, we open with Zorian's friend and classmate Benesek whispering worries that he misplaced a page of his test because Zorian's is so much longer. They're in Miss Bull's class, and Zorian is having to demonstrate what he knows through far more varied quizzes than his peers. On the positive side, she did seem to be taking him serious compared to his efforts in the past to wheedle more advanced instructions from his teachers. We get an interesting byline about Benesek, who keeps trying to whisper to Zorian about how Zorian has found his antics more and more irritating as the restarts have piled on. I think this might be our first sign of the mental age mismatch. Zorian has effectively lived a year more than his peers. He has learned and matured just a bit more. Perhaps Benesek would have mellowed out through the year as well, but due to the restarts, he's forever frozen as he was at the start of the second year of Sayorian Academy. As annoying as Benesek might be, Zorian wasn't ready to give up on him just yet. Whether this resolve would hold throughout the entire time Luke remains to be seen. I get the feeling the nature of their relationship might forever be altered, even if Zorian popped out of the restarts right now. When class is over and Nora Bull collects his test to grade, we are treated to an interesting byplay. He describes her as a very expressive woman, and we see the results of Zorian's test by her emoting. Pleasant surprise at the normal test, shock into glee at the second test. The gaze she stabs at Zorian afterwards causes him to flinch. Turns out the second test was to try and scare him off. Nora Bool is nothing if not passionate about spell formula. Zorian starts getting a little worried if he's joining a cult. Personally, I'm not a fan of tests for the sake of scaring someone off, because it kind of feels a little gatekeepy, and especially in the context of an education system sort of setting, it seems to run counter. You know, the, the point should be providing knowledge and people learning, not trying to 
dissuade people from things they might be interested in. Nora had ugh. Nora has Zorian define spell formula for us, which is a neat detail over the teacher describing it to the student. We know from as recent as Ilsa's office last chapter that Zorian has a particular interest in this field. Uh, of course, he's done some research and he has some opinions about it. It's the practice of using geometric shapes and various sigils to modify spells, usually in order to strengthen wards or amplify spellcasting by limiting mana flow along predetermined pathways. Nora is quite pleased with his answer, but we'll need a couple days to set things up for the tutoring. Though she mentions he should visit Ilsa today so that he can repay her for the favor of setting this up. Oh, Ilsa, you scallywag, you. Zorian finds himself at the train station. Not to board it to avoid the invasion, but it seems he is waiting for someone to arrive. A white-haired teenager that roughly matches a particular student we have only seen come up a couple times. And it is confirmed that we will be meeting with Hale the Morlock. Only, it seems like Hale has a barnacle attached to him, a little girl. Introductions go around and we learn the little girl is Kana, his daughter. Doing a bit of mental math, Zorian figures that Kale was a parent at the age of about 13 or so. Oh boy, looks like there is a story there. Zorian, however, understands how awkward this appears and the guff Kale may have dealt with in the past and is completely fine not bringing things up, especially because he notes the mother does not appear to be around. We learn that Kale is mostly self-taught in his magic school education. He got a good offer to attend the academy, and it seems his teacher and wife both got sick with the weeping. Oof. Guess we didn't have to wait long to learn about what happened there. Considering weeping is capitalized in the text, it's an event of some importance, and it's occurred in the very recent history. We're gonna have to keep an eye out on that for more details. I think it will be most interesting to pin it on the historical timeline in the context of the other major event that we're aware of, the Splinter Wars. Because a major disease happening in the context of a major war makes me kind of think of the Great Influenza Epidemic, uh, often mistakenly called the Spanish Flu. That was made much more deadly at the time, as a lot of places on war footing were suppressing and censoring news and knowledge about it, or morale and not to show weakness to their enemies sort of things, which exasperated it and caused it to be significantly more dangerous than it otherwise could have been. Zorian admires Kale's perseverance, being a single parent, teaching themselves magic, getting a scholarship to Sayoria. Only five or six a year are given out. Kale reveals it's likely because his focus is on medicine. He vowed to ensure a tragedy like the weeping could never happen again. We get a brief scene that feels kind of stilted after this. Uh, we're back in class and Akoja is pestering Zorian about where he was. Zorian thinks about blowing her off, but he's wanting to make a better effort about learning and about his... Uh, Zorian wants to make a better effort yeah. Zorian almost blows her off, but he wants to make a better effort about learning about his fellow peers and, you know, giving them a chance. He kind of gets the vibes from her that she's concerned about him. Akoja responds with some unflattering observations about how Kale looks, to which Zorian calls her out on. It's kind of a few odd paragraphs. Buried in it is Zorian thinking back on conversations with Zack and how Zorian hasn't really tried to get to know his classmates. Feels like it sits, sits a little bit weird in the text, but perhaps it is simply a breadcrumb foreshadowing of some events to come. Shortly, we cut to a few days later when Nora Bool has organized the lesson for Zorian. She certainly seems to be someone who goes all out. The facility is one that requires special permission for students to visit. We get our first taste of what spell formulas are with an almighty cube! Essentially a blank slate 
for Zorian to do a programmer's Hello World equivalent. Make it float, shine, spin, conditional activation, etc. Zorian's first thought is that he now has the perfect shiny toy to distract his little sister Creel with. <laughs> we get a bit of information about how some areas where invocations fail and spell formulas shine. Namely, invocations disperse after a short period. They only last hours at the most. Not very good if you want to set an alarm or shield your tent when camping, I'd imagine. It seems Nora teaches by throwing the student into the deep end. For his first cube, Zorian needs to make it activate verbally through command words, whether it's being addressed specifically, multiple brightness, directional shining, covering it with something will automatically turn it off, segmented sides so they can be individually turned on and off, and it can be keyed to other people so they can also control it. So Zorian's task is to make Siri the lamp. That's that's what he's got to do. He's got to make... Hey, hey Siri, turn on the top side. <laughs> All of these thoughts are going through Zorian's head as he arrives at Zvin's for mentoring. It has been many chapters since we've had an actual scene with Zvin, and not a one-sentence throwaway. Something is going to be different. It seems practicing the fundamentals has finally satisfied Zvim, though there's a bit of an ironic twist as he only tests Zorian with two of the three, assuming the third one, controlling fire, is just as good, where actually it's Zorian's weakness. And maybe Zorian's a water mage? What kind of teenager isn't speedrunning the fire spell? Like, come on! Zorian is given a blindfold, and Zvim is going to have him work on sensing mana by throwing marbles at him, which he has to say which side they're going or dodge them as, that, as they will also be sent at his noggin. Zvim really is the teacher of all time, isn't he? <laughs> the rest of the month progresses on pace. With Nora so excited to teach, she wants to set up a second day for extra lessons. Whether that's because impressing Ilsa, his lessons with Nora, or Zvin's begrudging acceptance of Zorian's com competency, he begins to notice teachers and his peers taking him more serious. It seems Zorian is beginning to get to a state where he's exceeding people's expectations of him. Unfortunately, due to Kale's whole child situation and wanting to avoid attention, this sort of torpedoes Zorian's greater attempts to get to know the Morlock this cycle. Suddenly, Zorian finds himself waking up, Kriel jumping on him. The loop happened, but it didn't look to ha be through any action of his own. There wasn't any reason for him to be killed. He can't think of anything that would kill him faster than he could feel or notice anything. Zorian's mind instantly kicks into gear, and he eventually comes to the conclusion that Zack died. And when his soul was pulled back to the start, it dragged Zorian's with him which would make him soul bonded to Zack. We open the next chapter with Zorian in a bit of a mood. His search for more information on soul bonds turns up nothing useful. All the same information he already knows. Soul bonds are dangerous, poorly understood, and capable of horrifying side effects. The main issue is that one person starts to mentally and spiritually dominate the other person, which effectively causes the other person's psyche to mimic the dominator and becoming obediently deferential. This process is okay with a familiar bond as the human is dominating an animal which isn't sentient. Sorian is barely holding it together. He's in a fit of rage, his hands are trembling. He's trying to calm himself down. There's no doubt that Zack would overpower Zorian in a soul bond situation. He has about six times the mana reserves and years more experience. To add a cherry on top, Zorian presumes the part responsible for getting him in the time loop is the part of the soul bond, so he can't have it removed, or else all of his progress will be lost. It will be for nothing. All of Zorian's worrying introspection means he's unprepared for when Tyvan makes her usual visit to his room. We learn more details about the job Tyvan was always trying to recruit him into. Apparently, she's picked up a side quest to uh, grind out some XP after graduating Sayuria and needs a magic DPS to fill out the party while hunting for the 10 rat tails in the local basement. Oh, okay, hold on. 
I got, I got, I got my notes mixed up. Uh, no, it's a, it's a much more mundane and realistic task. Hold on. Let's. There are uh, something about spiders who in the sewer. Uh, they mugged a guy. Yeah, yeah, that's what that that's the right note this time. Well, Zorian decides this would be a good distraction to settle his nerves and accepts for once. Hyvin kisses him on the cheek in excitement while thanking him profusely and running off. Zorian is definitely very much over his crush on Tyvin, and there is absolutely no reason at all why he decided to just hit the EP quick like by taking a sleep potion rather than deal with his thoughts about the situation. The next day, Zorian heads to class and we once again meet up with Briam, uh, the person who has a familiar bond with a fire drink who's shown up a couple times in the text. We learn a couple de couple more details about soul bonds, but nothing that outright assuages Zorian's fears. Participants sometimes feel something, but not everyone. Usually takes an elaborate ritual to initiate the bond, but many of the bond side effects are things that Zorian can apply to his experiences. But a, uh, an ancient lich probably is much more skilled in soul spells than a simple ritual. Most concrete tidbit that we do get is physical proximity and personal interaction is needed for a bond to mature. Zorian resolves to avoid Zack even more so than his current plan of avoiding Zack. On his way to the meeting place with Tyvin, he comes across a park that feels strangely familiar. After a moment, he realizes it's the place with that girl whose bike went into the creek on the first day. Was it a path he usually took? He looks near the bridge to see if the bike is still there. Unfortunately, the heavy rain from the other day has definitely washed it away by now. He does see a little cat looking at the raging water, and he's struck by a deep sense of sadness when it turns and meets his eyes. Feeling unnerved, he moves on. This is two pointed events today that Zorian has gotten vibes from a person. You know, the Akoja's concern to him, the this cat's sadness. Hmm. I, I, feel, I feel like we, we've got a common breadcrumb that's starting to thread through here. And the fact that it's coming up so recently and repeatedly, I feel like we're going to be stumbling onto something soon. Zorian finally finds the meeting place, no thanks to Tyvin's instructions, and is introduced to... Grunt and mumble. Ah. You know, I get the feeling that Tyvin should not be allowed to pick nicknames. Or should be the only person to pick nicknames. I, I don't know which would be funnier. We get an amusing line about how Zorian does not care for chess. Oh no, the trope of the smart thinky protagonist being an amazing chess whiz is overturned. Although, personally, I do think that trope is way overdone. The less said about Code Gaius's use of that metaphor, the better. We are introduced to the dungeon. It's a labyrinth of caves and tunnels beneath the world. Apparently, mana becomes denser the further down you go. Which makes it an interesting tidbit that all humans are on the surface, but it seems there are some truly nasty creatures out there, which can only live in such excessive amounts of dense mana. Even an experienced archmage is not safe to travel without care. Hilariously, it's obviously used as a natural sewer and flood control system for any human sub settlement. To such an extent, they've even cultivated specific species of oozes and other monsters to maintain and care for it. And whenever a new human settlement is set up, they kind of pick some of them to repopulate. I guess Slime Rancher is a much more realistic game than one expects. Apparently, the man hiring Tyvin and co. got an important watch mugged from him by giant spiders in the dungeon. Yeah, 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 that checks out. There, There is no need to examine that any further. That seems pretty fine. Anyway, while they're in the dungeon, they try to use divination to find giant spider, but they don't get any results. Uh, they're kind of stuck and having tried nothing, leaving them with anything they can do, uh, a wandering they do go. 
A couple hours of cardio later, that Zorian suddenly begins to feel a little bit eepy. He instantly begins fighting it off as the sleep spell is held off. Tyvin, Grunt, and Mumble make their own efforts with varied performance, but only seconds pass before it lifts and another mental strike occurs. A blast of memories and images directly into his mind, confusing him and also seeming to be his past memories? We get treated to a rapid fire set of scenes that Zorin is likely to have gone through in past cycles, but one of those memories doesn't appear to be one of his. A war troll tearing through white walls that seem to be made of cobwebs? And a question. Are you, I thought? The memories seem to pause as if expecting Zorian to respond. It returns more strange architecture, webs across lightless chasms, orbs of light woven in them. You don't understand me, do you? And then the feelings of pity and sadness, frustration, resignation. All of the images cease, and Zorian is left with a raging headache. Nothing is around them. His friends are knocked out by the sleeping spell. He piles their bodies on a floating disc spell and hits the bricks from the dungeon to the nearest entrance. We next find Zorian suddenly waking up uh, an indeterminate amount of time later. And he's kind of confused. His memories are all kind of mixed up and jumbled and he doesn't even remember how he got to a hospital. It also seems like Ilsa is paying him a visit. We get a bit of an awkward moment where he thinks she's here to interrogate him. Seems Zorian has had some issues with the coppers in the past and being questioned. Zorian wonders how he was able to better resist the sleep spell compared to his more experienced combat combatant peers. And from the images, the voice seemed to be trying to speak to him, but didn't know how to talk to humans. Sapient telekinetic magical spiders? Not anything Zorian has ever heard of. Ilsa forbids Zorian from going into the dungeon, and yeah, yeah, that's that's fair. That's that's pretty fair. Later, Pavian is trying to help Zorian practice for getting past Zim's Marble Olympics, but she would rather teach him combat magic. Unfortunately, Zorian is not a combat specialist. There isn't really much she can help him with, but she says she's going to make plans. This latest scare has Zorian trying to map out a concrete plan and stop bumbling around so much in his learnings and understanding of the situations. So he breaks things down. One, time loop. How it came to be, how it functions, how, it, how to exit it. Two, the invasion. Why is it happening? It's too conveniently timed, so what is its connection to the loop? And to accomplish both of those objectives, he needs to prioritize divination, information gathering, and infiltration. All right, it's time for Zorian to go on a ninja training montage. He plans to finish his on again, off again, library apprenticeship. Make sure he has all of their spells and understands where everything is kept because a lot of divination is hinging on knowing what questions to ask and how to interpret the information. He also thinks of continuing his efforts of impressing Ilsa and choosing divinations over spell formula, as if the person who would be teaching divination has half the energy of Nora Bool, he's going to make great progress in learning an elsewise kind of tricky discipline. Resolved, Zorian begins walking up to his apartment, and we cut to black. Kiriel is jumping on him, and he wakes up at the beginning of another loop. Seems like Zack died again. Talk about skill issue. Only been a few days. Oh, silly Zack. What a klutz. Hopefully he wouldn't make a habit out of this. It's uh, pretty inconvenient to be yanked back. Zack wouldn't really be the kind of person to try and death prog through something, right? Right? And that's where our recap of the chapters will end. 
So to date, starting with his most recent awakening, Zorian has been through roughly 14 months since he first woke up for uh, this month. Uh, so happy birthday, Zorian. You know, you're, you're already one year older. Telekinetic magic spiders. It seems like it might have been kind of sapient because it was speaking to him, even if it was in a jumbled bit of images sometimes, if the um, messages weren't exactly human understandable, uh, because in, in the text itself, um, the creature, whenever it seems to be saying words to Zorian, they're in uh, brackets. So it's in some kind of other language or perhaps like directly into his mind. So it's a little bit up to interpretation how that is understood, which makes it interesting because a lot of the monsters from the invasion come out from the sewers. So are these creatures perhaps working with the invasion? Is this going to be a new thread for finding out what's going on with the invasion? Hmm. Are there other possible sapient creatures that we might meet? You know, we have a spider, but you know, what about what about a worm? Hey, you know, eh, eh, eh. Ah, fuck. But that's gonna be it for bookworms today. Our next chapters we're going to be going over is going to be chapters 13 through 15. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you in a couple weeks.